welcome to Chemistry 51C Organic Chemistry. This is the third quarter uh, of organic chemistry here at UC Irvine. And to get to this place, you've made it so far. <laughs> you know, getting into college <laughs> at UCI, um, taking a year of freshman chemistry and <laughs> another two quarters of, uh, of organic chemistry in the Chem 51 series in order to get here. So I super appreciate the the efforts that it took to get here and uh, I welcome you to our class. And I always start off my class by uh, giving an introduction to the syllabus and the structure of the class. I'm not sure if it's that different from what other people are doing, but uh, it'll help us frame uh, really the, the way the class is set up, ultimately leading to a, a letter grade in the class, which is kind of the, the, the main thing that the registrar is looking for. So uh, this quarter, we're going to be using the Gorzinski Smith textbook by, uh, in organic chemistry. And I am still using the fifth edition because that's what I used in the spring. And for those of you who bought the sixth edition, you're welcome to use the sixth edition. They've ch moved a few of the chapters around. I'll try to make reference to that uh, as we go along. Um, but what's inside the chapters is not really that different. So, uh, and our website has a translation uh, to help you figure out uh, if I tell you don't work on a certain number of problems, uh, we've correlated those with the ones in the, the, the sixth edition uh, chapters. So uh, I always like to advertise why I think it's important to invest your time and energy to master problem solving in organic chemistry, uh, to master the language of organic chemistry and organic chemistry structures. And we're moving into an increasingly technological society. And I just feel like every aspect of our society is dominated by technology that involves organic chemistry. So starting off from the computer chips that are running your computer, those are made using uh, 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 this goop called photoresist, which is organic molecules. They respond to light and they use those to make the patterns on the computer chips that are running your computer, that are running your phone or whatever kind of device that you're using right now. The optical switching that's running your network, you know, some of the newest optical switching devices are based on organic molecules, um, oftentimes hold copper or other metal atoms in there. Uh, the displays that you're starting to see nowadays, OLED displays, the O stands for organic, organic light emitting diodes. Those are based on organic molecules, uh, electroluminescent, they give off light uh, when, when they're um, exposed to a current or potential. Energy storage. So there's so much effort being invested now in uh, lithium ion batteries and storable energy. And the reason you can get electrons to stay on one side of the, you know, the, the membranes that they use inside of these lithium, lithium ion batteries are made by synthetic organic chemists, people who took a class just like this to learn the principles of organic chemistry. The new smart materials that you're hearing about um, that, that maybe they can respond and, and change, make colors when you, um, they can respond and make colors when you stretch them or when they deform or they're ready to break, they, they give some sort of indication or they heal themselves. Those are designed by synthetic organic chemists. So it's really powerful if you're interested in technology or engineering uh, to, to learn the principles of organic chemistry. Now, most of you who are taking this class are probably interested in medicine or, or some uh, health related field. And uh, I, I put this together last March, just as we were starting the spring quarter, uh, some of the newest treatments that they were starting to develop in the laboratories, the small molecule treatments, were, were organic molecules designed and built by synthetic organic chemists using the kinds of reactions that we learn in Chem 51C, not Chem 51B, not Chem 51A, but it's all Chem 51C. That's why this is the best class to teach. I love teaching chemistry 51C. It's where everything comes together, where we teach you how to build molecules. Uh, like this amide bond that you see here. Uh, in chapter 22, we'll teach you how to make amides like this bond, esters like this bond, and this bond here. We're gonna teach you in chapter 18, uh, right off the bat, how to make bonds to benzene rings like this bond here and this bond here. Uh, we'll teach you how to make nitrogen carbon bonds to benzene rings uh, like this one right here. We'll teach you principles of salt formation, which is important in formulation of drugs. Um, so, so much uh, that goes into the drug development process for small molecule drugs, the ones that you take as pills usually. 
Uh, that comes from synthetic organic chemistry and it comes from chemistry 51C. Super excited. Um, you know, a lot of you are probably just thinking, I just wanna make it through this course. I don't care about organic chemistry. I just need to get the grade, move on, get my degree in biological sciences or whatever, uh, and then go on and get admitted to some um, preparatory school for dentistry or medicine or ophthalmology. That's fine. Um, but all of those kinds of tests for admission to those schools require that you know something more about organic chemistry. And there are courses you can take by places like Kaplan, and they charge you a lot of money to help you prepare for those courses. But they're not designed to be courses that teach you from scratch. These are supposed to be review courses that you pay a lot of money for. And so you're best off learning the material now uh, so that when you go review for these these um, medical school admissions tests or health school admissions tests that you'll be in a better position. And I promise you that the people who teach those classes, I promise you they're not better than me and they are not better than my team that I have to help us this quarter. So I'm paid by the university to assign grades at the end of the quarter. That's basically what they, they pay me to do, to teach you and then to assess whether you learned the material. And I've got an amazing team I've got two TAs, uh, Jason Combs and Matt Duong are, are their Sherpas along with me to help guide you through this course and to learn the material. We haven't yet up updated our office hours on, on the class website. Uh, we'll go ahead and make sure that we do that. Um, uh, let me just take a look here. Uh, I just got a chat that's, that said, hey, there were some people in the wrong Zoom meeting, maybe in my personal Zoom meeting room. And I, so for those of you who missed the first few minutes, really this, this whole set of slides for the introduction, let me just go back very quickly, is all on the course website. It's basically why you should be excited in or, about organic chemistry, whether it's engineering new technology or health molecules, and really invest in this course now, because if you're, even if you're interested in going to medical school and you don't care about organic chemistry, they still expect you to understand molecules organic molecules at the level of atoms and bonds. And so please invest now. Again, our team here, um, uh, again, an amazing team. We're gonna be here to support you. And I, I refer to us as Sherpas. You know, what is a Sherpa? Let me just remind you what a Sherpa is. You know, these are people who live up in, in Nepal at amazing altitudes and are used to working and operating where the air is rarefied and it's hard to survive. And for people who say that they're going to climb Everest or they have climbed Everest, nobody just goes on an expedition to climb Everest. You have a team of Sherpas who help haul all your gear up to some base camp for you. And then your, your Sherpa team helps, helps you by doing that so that you can make the final ascent. And that's our goal. Our goal is to help you. We are experts at working at these altitudes uh, in the field of organic chemistry. We love organic chemistry. But it's your job to make the final ascent. Nobody's gonna carry somebody to the top of Everest. So you have to be willing to put in the work and you need to rely on us as your team to help you get there. Now, here's what we're covering this quarter. So whether you're using the, you've used the fifth edition or the sixth edition of the, the Gorzinski Smith Organic Chemistry textbook, I've got the fifth edition shown here in this picture. It's the same kind of material in 51A and 51B um, you didn't cover, it might have seemed like a lot of chemistry, but you just didn't cover that many reactions. We are just going to pile on the reactions this quarter. That's really what organic chemistry is about, is lots and lots of reactions and transformations. So this quarter in Chemistry 51C, we're going to be covering uh, chapters 18 through 25 in the book. That's what our course will cover, and that's what I'm going to test you on. I'm going to make sure you understand how to do problem solving. Um, I taught this course last fall and put my, my videos on Yuja, but I don't have that linked on the website because I also taught this same course in the spring and all of those videos are posted for my uh, spring are posted on YouTube. I don't think you can look up the word 51C, but maybe if you look up Van Vranken, Organic Chemistry, you'll find a link to all the videos for all the lectures um, from just a few months ago for this course. Um, and of course, every, every lecture that I do this quarter, I will also be recording and posting on, um, on the web. And um, so there's no need to worry about Yuja. You'll have my spring videos and the videos from, from this fall to rely on. 
You know, everything that you did in 51A and 51B, according to the book, was super geared towards you learning SN2 reactions. What a mistake. <laughs> That's not the way biology works. That's not the way modern synthetic organic chemistry works. Uh, the way biology and synthetic organic chemistry work is you attack carbonyls, C double bond O, or, or for DNA and RNA, P double bond O. There's no SN2 and stuff like that. That's rare in, in biology. So um, the hardest th problems that you're going to have, when I see people having a problem on exams, on problem sets, it's because of two reasons. It's because number one, they can't see hydrogens that aren't drawn for them. You're supposed to be able to recognize when there's hydrogens, even though they're not drawn on skeletal structures. And the other problem I see is people can only remember SN2 reactions. Those, those are the biggest problems that, that we face as we come into the Chem 51C series, because we're doing other stuff. We moved on from that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the whole, the whole university has finally switched over to Canvas. So if you've got the Canvas app, uh, I presume everybody here has access to Canvas. You can click on our, uh, on our icon here for the fall, uh, fall 20 chemistry 51C. And uh, our, the syllabus that's listed on Canvas serves as our syllabus for the course. That, uh, we used to hand out paper syllabi, but nobody does that anymore. Generally, instructors shouldn't be changing their syllabi after the second week, which used to be the drop date. Uh, I try not to make any, any changes. I try to have everything set, but uh, I'll mention a few cases where we're a little bit worried about um, maybe making a slight change to, what we're, uh, to what's going on. And really the most important thing for you is the examinations and how your grade is determined. I think that's all of you, what all of you are worried about. So I'm dividing this up here so you can see how I'm doing it this quarter because I understand that it's hard to learn when we're doing remote instruction. It's hard to learn when there's social unrest and elections and stuff like that. And so I've made accommodations for you in the way that I run this course. Uh, and these are different from the way that I've offered my class in previous years. In previous years, there was 10% of the grade was due to the homework on sapling. And then there were two exams worth 25% of the grade each and one mandatory final exam worth 40% of the grade and cumulative. The exams were longer, they were harder, the mechanisms were longer, the synthesis problems were more complex. Um, but what, the way we're doing it now, because we understand things are more difficult, um, is uh, you have an option of dropping the lowest exam grade for the class. So if there's some period where you just had some thing happen, okay, I'm gonna automatically drop your lowest exam grade. And the final exam is going to count as one of those exams, and so if you, feel like your grade is looking good heading into the final exam, you don't even have to show up. I'll just drop that one if you get a zero on that for not showing up. So I don't offer makeup exams because I'm dropping the lowest exam. There's no such thing for that. And I never used to offer dropping the lowest exam grade before. Um, so it's just a more challenging period right now. So I honor you for going through this process um, of learning and investing in your education uh, during this whole coronavirus thing. Now, I, I assign grades um, on a curve. I would never lower your grade because of a curve, but if the curve almost always leads to higher grades in the class um, and based on this distribution here. If you make over a 90% on my final, you will get an A in the class because I'm convinced I'll make a, I'm going to make a comprehensive cumulative final. So um, something that will make me confident that if you can make over 90%, then you really know the material. I've put down our course calendar here, right? We're, we're, we have 10 weeks here at the end of the, of the 2020 calendar year. Um, and if you look at the, the modules section in our Canvas website, it spells out some of the sections. And I'm pretty sure that our first exam is gonna, as, I, as I've listed on the Canvas website, is gonna be October 18th. It's gonna cover chapters 18 and 19. That's different from last year and previous years. So I post all my, my exams from prior years on our Canvas website in the files folder. You can access them there. Um, but our first exam this fall is not gonna cover chapter 20. Whereas if you look at previous exam ones, they will have covered chapter 20. Um, I'm a little bit still tentative about the date for exam two because we have to make sure that when you take exam two, you've had the material in lecture, you've practiced it in discussion section and had the chance to work the sampling problems. And I'm still um, dinkering around, just trying to make sure that, that we've got the date 
set correctly so you get that practice. Um, so it's subject to change. I hope I don't have to change that, um, but right, there's nothing I can do at this stage because I'm just working to the last moment um, to try to get things going. Um, <clears throat> We, uh, we don't publish this particular, this is my own internal calendar that I use to manage the, I, I don't publish it in this way. I tell you the exam dates and the, we list the, the times, but um, this is my own kind of personal uh, Excel calendar that I use. Okay, we're gonna be using Sapling for homeworks. All of you probably use Sapling already for either Chem 51A or 51B or other classes. I'm hoping everybody knows how to use Sapling. Um, all sapling assignments are due at 11.59 a p.m. Sorry, James, let me, let me fix that. That should be p.m. Um, on the date, on the due date. So not 12 o'clock midnight, because that's actually, I think, the next day. So, um, so uh, 11.59 p.m. So just make sure you, you click on the, your final submit button or something for those. We're also going to have our exams on sapling. And the last time I taught this course in the spring, I had this problem where the problems had so many different formats. Sometimes draw every electron pair, draw every hydrogen atom, and that's ridiculous. So I went back to the homeworks and I took away all those problems and made it so that they all don't require you to draw every single hydrogen atom or every single electron pair. That's ridiculous. Nobody has time to do that during an exam. Um, and so now the format of all the, the problem sets our sapling problem sets will be the same as the exam. So you don't have to get used to some new format when you take the exam. It'll be, it will be familiar to you because you should be working those sapling problems um, <clears throat> this fall. Um, our discussion sections. I expect you to attend every single discussion section that, you, that you're assigned to. We don't take attendance in our discussion sections. But this is really where you get a chance to do the three things that are important in science, and that's learn to collaborate and communicate, and most importantly, solve problems. That's what I'm going to grade you on in my exams is your problem solving ability. So, and if you don't practice talking about science with other people and applying scientific principles to solve problems, I don't know what you're going to, that's what you're supposed to be learning in, in college if you're getting a degree in any kind of science or if you're heading to a medical profession. You need to be able to talk about science with other people and collaborate with them to solve problems. And so start now when it's easy and when, when the stakes are low. Um, it may seem scary to, to, you know, to speak up and to write organic structures when other people are watching. Get over it. <laughs> you know, we were, I was like you, scared to say something or write something. And, you know, this should be a very supportive environment here, um, especially during discussion section. So go to discussion section. We post uh, problem sets on, in the Canvas files section for every discussion section. Try to look at it beforehand. And when you go to discussion section, we're going to break uh, people up into breakout rooms of three, four, five students. And you can work on the problem you're assigned together. And then when we bring you out of your breakout rooms after about half an hour, we'll ask you to say, okay, what did you think about the problem? Show people what, what your group was thinking there. How did you work on it or solve it? Or why did you get stuck or something like that? It's just a chance to chat. Um, so yeah, so uh, we haven't completely updated all the discussion section times on, on the course on the Canvas website. So the times are set, it's just that who, which TA is covering which one. That's, that's what's not set. So please go to discussion section. It's super important um, to help you do these important things like talk about science. You know, we have a bigger team than just the TAs and me. You know, we have two amazing Chemistry 51C peer tutors, uh, Tao Pham and Jason Lowe. You know, the department runs this whole tutoring program. They're undergraduates just like you. So if you don't trust anything that I'm saying, you can ask, hey, does Van Franken ask those kinds of questions on an exam? And the peer tutors will, will tell you straight up. You know, they're there to help you do better in this class. Um, you know, how do you use their time? If you want, just go sit in their office hours and say, hey, I'm going to work problems. And if I think of something to ask you, I'll ask you or something. They, the, the saddest thing in the world is when I, as an instructor or a peer tutor or somebody, opens up their office hours and nobody comes. God, that is demoralizing. Yeah, I mean, there's no agenda. You don't have to come with some super smart question. Just turn on the Zoom video and work problems by yourself until you can think of something or listen to other people. 
ask questions. They're probably the same ones you have. Okay, so my, uh, if you guys are out there, Thou and Jason, uh, hello. Um, they've been assigned to my class. They attend the lectures. They're familiar with the material. They know how to ace the class. So uh, try to figure out how to ace the class from them. Um, oh, whoa, I am missing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we have a Lark tutor. I have another slide that I must have accidentally del deleted for Christopher Pham. He is the Lark tutorial leader and he's listed on our, our Canvas website. Sorry, Christopher, if I, <laughs> for leaving your, I, I lost your slide here. It also had a link to, to Lark. Um, you know, the, I think you meet two times a week for the Lark sessions. It's just another uh, venue in which you can practice and it is specifically uh, tailored to, to get you ready for my class to have you thinking about problems, talking about problem solving and um, communicating with other people. And basically it's just a, another opportunity uh, for you to in parallel um, work on the material related to our class. Okay, um, how do you communicate with me? I, you know, I had some people uh, send me emails somehow through Canvas last and I, it's like those messages went into cyberspace and I didn't get them till a week later. Or they went into my junk email or just something. And they were like, why didn't you ever respond to me? Uh, just send me regular emails, but don't send me emails about chemistry content. I cannot answer any questions by typing on a keyboard, right, about chemistry. If you want to ask me about an exam date or how come that sapling problem set is not up, I, that I can answer. If you want to ask me questions about chemistry, go to my office hours or go to Jason's office hours or Matt's office hours or the peer tutor's office hours. That's where to ask uh, questions that relate to chemistry or a specific problem in sapling or on the book. Um, or after class, I'll have to see what I, um, if I'm capable of hanging around after class for a few minutes after I shut off my uh, the Zoom. Um, certainly come to my office hours to ask questions. You know, when you send me questions, and this is true for sending any professor question, questions by email, don't start off by saying quick question, because whoever's reading your email doesn't care whether your question is quick and poorly thought out. We care about whether the answer is quick. Ask us questions by saying, you can answer this quickly, and then make your question short so that's possible. Don't send huge long emails where the real question is three, three words long at the end of the email, just start off with this. This just is a matter of professionalism and that's gonna be expected of you here at UCI and when you, when you leave later. Uh, the other thing would be a, a question that is so general, there's no way I could answer it in less than 50 pages. Like if somebody says, what should I study for the exam? Like you could type that out on your iPhone pretty easily, but I can't answer a question like that. That's not reasonable. So. Try to be professional in, in what you're asking and uh, please respect my time. I love teaching organic chemistry. I got a lot of stuff to do and there's a lot of students in the class um, that I have to think about here. I always follow up with these, these words from Benjamin Franklin. He had all these little pithy maxims and one of them was drive thy business. And this quarter, Chemistry 51C is your business. You signed up for the class, you're paying tuition, you know, you need to be really hard nosed about getting the most out of what you paid money for. I, I think on average, I mean, these, the lectures, if you cost out the lectures, you're paying quite a bit um, to hear the lectures and to be part of this class. He, he also said, drive thy business or it will drive thee, right? If you fall behind, once you fall behind in a class and the exams and the deadlines are starting to line up on you, sometimes you're never going to catch up. And um, you might think, well, I can drop the lowest grade on my exam. I'm sure I'll have time to catch up later. It just doesn't work like that. So stay on top of the material, get on it and stay on it. Um, and that's, it's, I'm not saying that's easy to do, but I'm telling you that's what you need to do. Okay, let's go ahead and get started on the, on the course content here. You know, I usually start off by talking about something that I've seen recently in the news or in the literature and I, I was listening to this podcast but from, that was put out by the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, and I forgot the, the, the name of the podcast, but they mentioned ractopamine, which is a molecule I'd never heard of, and I looked it up, and it's related to um, these livestock shows that they have at fairs, county fairs, and 
uh, regional fairs. There's a picture of some winner of the, this was, this was the 2019 grand champion of the Market Barrow, um, I, I guess, contest in Ohio, where somebody raised the, this, this animal and it won, and it won, and it sold for $33,000. Wow, I mean, you put some effort in and you, you get something if you've got a prize winning, um, if you've got a prize winning pig or hog. So, so how does ractopamine relate to this? It turns out that ractopamine is a small molecule that's synthesized by synthetic organic chemists, and they sell this. This is Purina brand ractopamine. It's sold as Paline 900. It's a synthetic chemical that leads to lean muscular pigs. And so you fatten them up, and then in some period before you're getting ready to have your show, you start feeding them this stuff, and it really buffs them up. Um, you know, so they're, they're muscular and they're fit. You know, they used to use this in the, um, in, in the pig and hog industry the, for the stuff they sell for meat, but they stopped doing this because it creates a lot of, uh, I think other countries especially are concerned about what additives are being added. Um, but they're still trying to decide whether to ban this for, uh, for pigs and hogs, you know, for swine that are shown at these county fairs. Um, I'm not sure what came out of that. Okay, let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and talk about chapter 18. What are we doing here in chapter 18? <clears throat> so really so far, what you've really learned in, in, in chemistry, in, in chemistry 51A and 51B, the, the main thing, the main theme that they've been teaching was to look for great leaving groups like iodide or bromide attached to things so that you can substitute those and make bonds, usually with nucleophiles. You've had a little bit of radical chemistry, um, but this is really the thing that you've been taught to do is to look for um, leaving groups. And so what we're going to be doing in this chapter that's difficult is we're going to be doing substitution reactions where it's not so obvious what the leaving group is. So I hope you've got this idea down that you can substitute leaving groups uh, under very specific circumstances. So alkyl iodides, alkyl bromides, alkyl chlorides to some extent, and alkyl tosylates and mesylates. But it depends on how you substitute them. So for example, if I move that iodide around so it's attached to a different position, there's no reaction that you know of that could be used to substitute that iodide. It doesn't undergo SN2, it doesn't undergo uh, uh, SN1, and it's the same deal if we talk about aryl uh, leaving groups attached to aryl rings. So you never in these cases see um, um, there's just no cases where you see SN1 or SN2 chemistry on these types of um, on these types of vinyl or aryl uh, halides. So you can't substitute those. It's only alkyl, and I drew allyl because that's one of the best. So what are we doing in chapter 18 that's different? So in chapter 18, we're going to be looking at electrophilic aromatic substitution, a type of substitution where it's not at all obvious what is the leaving group in this situation. So if I draw uh, um, the typical reaction that we're going to be doing for the next, uh, maybe uh, at least for another week, we're going to be doing this. We're going to show you some secret recipes. I'll show you five secret recipes for generating powerful electrophiles, recipes you've never seen before. And we're going to substitute to make a new bond. And what's being substituted here? It's an H atom, and we don't draw H atoms. You stop drawing H atoms back in, in chemistry 51A, and if you couldn't see all those hydrogen atoms there, then you didn't pick up the most important skill from 51A and 51B. You need to be able to, in your mind, see every hydrogen atom, even if it's not drawn for you. That's a critical, critical skill. Okay, so this chapter, we're gonna teach you five different recipes uh, for substituting hydrogen atoms that we don't draw usually on benzene rings. And so what are those, those secret recipes? Well, the first thing we need to teach you how to do is to put halogens onto benzene rings. And here's one recipe. Now you should already know that if you take bromine and you mix it with a benzene ring, you don't get addition across the double bonds. There's no reaction. So we add a special secret catalyst here. It's actually a Lewis acid catalyst and that's FeBr3, it's called ferric bromide. And, and, and also it's a similar situation if you wanna do chlorination, we use the same set of reagents. I don't really need to go into details with that, it's the same idea. We'll talk about the mechanisms 
when we come back on Monday. The other reaction that we're going to teach you how to do here is we're going to teach you how to nitrate benzene rings, add nitro groups, substitute H atoms uh, with, uh, with nitro groups. So that would look like this. You, you use nitric acid. Whoops. But you know what? Nitric acid is a strong acid. And it's scary because it's an oxidizing strong, powerful acid. It's not strong enough. You need to add an acid that is even more powerful than nitric acid. And that acid that you need to add is sulfuric acid. That's the catalyst that makes this go. It is so powerful, way more powerful at donating protons than nitric acid, that sulfuric acid will protonate the nitric acid. <laughs> That's kind of an amazing, scary acid, actually. Sulfuric acid is super powerful. So uh, another powerful recipe that you need to know about is, um, is how to make carbon-carbon bonds on benzene rings. How do you substitute the H atoms on benzene rings in order to generate carbon-carbon bonds? And there's a, a functional group that we haven't really, that you haven't talked about at all so far. And this is going to be your favorite, it should be, <laughs> By the end of this quarter, your favorite functional group for making bonds. I, I showed you a medicine a little bit earlier where I, I promised you I'd teach you how to make the bonds. These are some of the key reagents for doing that. It's called an acid chloride or an acyl chloride is the, the newer way to describe those. And in this case, we also need a powerful Lewis acid to tug on that chlorine atom and pull that chlorine atom off of the, the, the carbonyl group. And that Lewis acid that we add is aluminum trichloride. So aluminum trichloride is the powerful Lewis acid. Is that obvious that that's a, an L? I don't know how to draw an L there. That's aluminum trichloride. Powerful Lewis acid will yank that chlorine off and leave something like a, a carbocation. We'll draw it a different way. Okay, so that'll keep, that's how you make a carbon-carbon bond. It's the best way to make a carbon-carbon bond. Now, sometimes you need to make carbon-sulfur bonds. And our recipe there is that we add sulfur trioxide. We'll, we'll talk more about each of these, the, the mechanisms for these recipes, but our recipe is to add sulfur trioxide, but it's not powerful enough as an electrophile. We need a powerful acid in here to activate this, and the acid they use is the same one for nitration. Use sulfuric acid um, as the acid. So here's two reactions forming, adding nitro groups, you use sulfuric acid as a catalyst, and then when you add sulfonic acid groups, you use sulfuric acid as a catalyst. And you should have learned about toluene sulfonic acid before or tosyl chloride. That's how they put the carbon sulfur bond on there to make tosyl chloride and make to so you can make tosylates. Okay, the last reaction that I'm going to show you um, is for making carbon-carbon bonds to put alkyl groups on benzenes, not carbonyl groups. So you can take ethyl, isopropyl, t-butyl halides, chloride, bromide, iodide. I'm not going to specify the alkyl group and I'm not going to specify the halide. I'll just write Rx. And we use the same Lewis acid catalyst that we used to make, put the carbonyl group on the benzene ring, and that's aluminum trichloride. I'll draw it with a cursive L there so you can tell it's aluminum or aluminium if you're from the UK. So these are the five recipes that you need to know. I, I promise you Somehow on the exams, I'm going to be asking you the, about reactions with these, not just how to put them on unsubstituted benzene rings. The trick comes in with how you use them when there are other substituents on the benzene rings. But you've got to know these. Go practice them until you know them inside out and never make any mistakes in drawing these reagents out. But let me be completely straight with you. They're not all equally good. They're not. It turns out that the, the top three ones that I have right here these ones are the most useful. And the ones down here, eh, you know, I'll say they're less useful. You know, once you put a bromine atom on a benzene ring, we're going to tell you how to convert that into the most powerful nucleophile in organic chemistry, at least that you'll see in the Chemistry 51C series. Nitro groups, nobody really wants a nitro group on a benzene ring. People want to reduce those down, but if you, you, if you want to make a carbon-nitrogen bond, this is how you start. And then you convert the nitro group to something you want, like an NH2 amino group. Carbon-carbon um, bonds are super useful for 
um, you know, every organic chemist loves making carbon carbon bonds. That's how you make organic molecules bigger. Putting carbon sulfur bonds onto benzene rings, you know, there's a couple of pharmaceuticals out there, like Viagra is a famous one where there's a sulfonyl group on a benzene ring. But really, ever since the 1930s or 40s, where they developed this class of drugs called sulfa drugs, um, this has not become such an important reaction. I don't know why they still teach it. They're like in a 70 year time warp. Okay, but it's worth, and then this, this whole reaction of alkylation of benzene rings is just not very useful. You have to use your starting material in a vast excess. You have to use it as solvent for the reaction in order to prevent, and then you have to worry about whether the reaction will even work at all because most substituents will kill this reaction. So it doesn't even work. So there's so many exceptions to this last reaction, alkylation of benzene rings, uh, that we're, it's just not going to be as useful. But you still need to learn these five recipes. So make sure you get out of here and you learn these five recipes. It's going to be super essential. I'm trying to check the time here to make sure I'm on, um, my clock is showing 1236. Okay, you know, all those five recipes all go through the same basic mechanism. It's the same mechanism. And the only thing that is different is the electrophile that's adding to the benzene ring. Those five recipes just different, generate different electrophiles. Um, uh, for, um, for going through the, um, for going through the same mechanism. So let's talk about this mechanism for electrophilic aromatic substitution. I'm going to start off by drawing a benzene ring. There it is. And there's the, one of the, those the three double bonds. And we're going to have five recipes that each generate a different electrophile. And I'm symbolizing that electrophile with the letter E plus. It's not an element symbol. There's no, uh, I don't think there's an element E. Um, and so this is just a symbol to represent one of the five electrophiles that we're going to generate. And so this first step in the mechanism, this first mechanistic step is slow. It's hard because the first step involves <clears throat> using one of these, uh, these double bonds, which aren't reactive to attack that electrophile. And then when you do that, you make a bond between the atom and the electrophile. So let's go ahead and draw that in. Whoops, let me uh, go ahead and take that out and make sure I draw it in black. So I just uh, got this iPad to try to get higher contrast um, lecture drawing, so I didn't have to worry about the uh, the, the lighting situation. Um, <clears throat> so let me go ahead and draw this this electrophile attached to the benzene ring. But critically, what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw that at an angle. I'm going to remind you that there was an H atom right at that position, and we need to keep our eyes on that H atom. Whether you draw it or not, I, I recommend when you're starting out, you draw that because we're gonna have to take that off shortly. So you can't tell which carbon atom I, I'm adding. This, this red arrow, the curved arrow, doesn't tell you which carbon atom. You have to wait for me to draw that in. So here's this, this carbocation that we generate. And it looks like it's got a lot of resonance stabilization. So it ought to be stable, it is but it's not as stable as the benzene, the aromatic benzene ring we started with. This is a way slow uphill reaction that we're doing here. It's hard to get rid of aromaticity. You know, initially this benzene ring was super excited. It's like, wow, look at that electrophile. I'm gonna go attack that. And as soon as it does, it's like, oh, I lost aromaticity. That sucks. Now, anything can pull this proton off. Anything with a lone pair. Man, your grandma with a lone pair could pull this proton off. So, right, right. it's so much desires. So I'm going to draw a, a conjugate acid. Electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, like these five recipes, the conditions are always acidic. So I'm going to draw the conjugate, or, sorry, the conjugate base uh, that'll generate an acid under our conditions. And what happens now is that we, we pull this proton off and this, will now generate, regenerate aromaticity. Oh man, that feels good to regenerate aromaticity. So now there's this huge sigh of relief and our, our benzene ring now is missing that H atom and it's got an electrophile. The H got substituted by the E, the electrophile. That's why this is called electrophilic aromatic substitution. And we usually don't write the HA byproduct here uh, because nobody cares about that. Uh, but the, you build up acid as these reactions go along. And the second step is super fast. It's super fast because you want to regenerate aromaticity. 
boy, I mean, anything, the glassware and the oxygen atoms on your glassware could pull off that proton. Now, this, this special intermediate, we're going to talk a lot about this because the stability of that intermediate has powerful predictive capability for you to tell you. Uh, we have a special name for that. That, that, um, that intermediate is called an arenium ion. So where you formed a bond to a benzene ring and you have a carbocation that has all these resonance, um, resonance contributors to that, um, that's, the, um, that's called an arenium ion. And I'm going to refer to that. I might ask you questions. Draw an arenium ion and all the resonance structures. That sounds like an MCAT question to me right there. The kind of thing they would expect you to know from, from this kind of a chapter. Now, it, it looks so easy. It's like, oh, I'll remember that. I'm never going to make a mistake. Um, but that arenium ion is going to trick you because what's going to happen to you, I think, at least what I've seen in many cases in the past, is that when you get to this arenium ion, you're going to tend to want to fall back to chemistry that you know how to do. So let me go ahead and draw this arenium ion. I'll draw the H atom on top this time. And the carbocation, the, the carbenium ion is a more specific term here on that top carbon. And if you've got something in your solution that I'll draw as the conjugate base derived from an acid, you might have, I feel like every single fiber in your body is going to want to make you do this. Oh yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> because if you do that, you'll never get back aromaticity. And, and the arenium ion knows that. What happens here is this. This is what happens. You pull off the proton and you give that, those electrons to the carbenium ion. That's what happens there. Resist the temptation to attack carbocations. I, I realize you've spent seven months practicing attacking carbenium ions, this type of carbocation, but you know, that's not really, um, that's not really what um, happens here is you, you deprotonate. That's what we're showing you. Now this arenium ion, let me go backwards here. I, I apologize for this. I, I'm gonna take off these arrows um, and I'm just going to point out that there's a lot of resonance stabilization here to this arenium ion. And I mentioned that this is the kind of question they ask you on MCATs and DAT exams and the ones for optometry school. Uh, they ask you to recognize that we can draw resonance structures for this. So if I push these electrons up to that double bond, there's another resonance structure that we can get that looks, that moves that, that carbocation center uh, uh, down to this lower corner. And there's a third resonance structure that we can draw here, where I further push the, the electrons and move that, that positive charge, that, uh, that carbocation center down to this, this lower carbon there. So these resonance structures are important. Remember, don't attack the carbocation. You deprotonate arenium ions because that's how you get back aromaticity. Okay, that's the general mechanism. It's a two-step mechanism for electrophilic aromatic substitution. And the thing I haven't shown you yet is what's the recipes that we, how do those recipes I gave you generate different electrophiles that make carbon bromine bonds, carbon chlorine bonds, carbon nitrogen bonds, carbon carbon bonds. That's what we're gonna talk about when we come back on Monday. Uh, I'll teach you what these recipes are and we'll just walk through that same two-step mechanism over and over again. Um, um, and then once we've done that stuff, maybe in a few days, then we'll talk about, well, what happens if there's a substituent already on that benzene ring? How do you know which position you're going to attack? And that's going to take some explanation there. All right, that's it. Go, go work a bunch of problems on sapling. Our first sapling assignment is due next Thursday, and it's a review of chemistry 51B and A stuff. Just, I think like 10 questions, just to make sure you still remember something. Because after a whole summer or a quarter or however long it's been since you took Chem 51B, it's not gonna be fresh in your mind. So I want you to go back and um, try to get ready for that. I'll try to make available some extra presentation hours or something next week where I can try to help you uh, review. Maybe I'm thinking kind of early evening or something uh, where I can help you review stuff that you should remember from 51B and maybe not so much from 51A. You know, if you feel like you're behind and you entered this quarter without being strong in organic chemistry, it's, it's not like every chapter in the book was important. It's just a few chapters. It's like the alkene edition chapter, 
the redox reagents chapter like PCC and MCPBA and then maybe a couple the deals alder um, and if you can get back on that and be good with that you'll really be strong enough to enter this quarter uh, with your guns blazing 